I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast. Joining me today is a two-time Olympian, three-time Olympic medalist, eight-time world champion, TEDx speaker, and now an author. An author of the new book dropping this week titled Blueprint. Today we have Katie Hoff. Yay, thank you. Wow, look at you. You're all set up. You've got your, your medals in the background. looks like you're in a studio. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I had to uphold the expectations from last time when you guys complimented my lighting so much. So, yeah, now we moved to Michigan, so we're not living in a shoebox uh, <laughs> of an apartment. So we actually have room for I'm framing my Olympic flags for the first time and putting up my medals and world record holder you know, certificates. So that's been really fun. You know, there's a lot of weird things happening this year. It's been a tough year. It's been a hard year. But we're talking to a lot of your Olympic peers, your Olympic brothers and sisters, and a lot of them have tough moments happening, but they also have a lot of cool stuff happening. It's like there's this is a transformative year, and you absolutely fall in this bucket because pinning a, pinning a new book is a, is a transformative moment. You're dropping a book during a historic period of time, and – that's just daunting in itself. Congratulations. What, what, um, what was it? Was it frightening? Was it, was it intimidating? <laughs> All the above. Yes. You know, it's funny, even reading back through the book, uh, I actually have an audio uh, book version as well, which was really cool to have read my actual book for, but there's a part where it says 2020 for the Olympics. And I actually had to add in pre COVID when I, you know, when I was writing this. So yeah, I mean, I think, it was very intimidating because I never wanted to write a book and why I waited five full years to write one was I never wanted to write one and not be authentic. Right. So I had to face a lot of things that happened in my career. I had to be honest with myself, with, with how things happened. Um, so there was definitely some, some highs, some lows of writing it, but ultimately I feel like it was this amazingly cathartic experience where it was almost like a year of therapy going through, I worked with an incredible ghostwriter, Rick Bader, uh, and he was able to really capture my voice and coach me through it and ha have moments where he's like, you're not digging enough. There's more to that. Or um, it was like having a literary coach, essentially. Good for you. Cause it's a, uh, let's, let's be honest. A lot of our Olympic peers write books and they don't, I don't think they suffer. It's basically the press release. <laughs> um, it's the press release I was perfect. My life was amazing. And now I'm a shining star and I've, I'm in, 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 in an example of achievement. And the truth is, um, most everybody has struggles. Some people have more struggles than other. I would say that um, among everyone who's ever stepped onto the Olympic platform, I would say that yours is extraordinarily unique. And it is, I would say that you had hurdles and ups and downs that were, you had challenges that I think that, that is just not the typical Olympic experience. And I'm sure you dig into this in your book. If you if you do, drop it. But let's 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 get back to it. You know, what, where how do you? And if I pick up, if I get Blueprint, and um, and I'm diving in, I'm tucking in on a Sunday morning with my coffee, and I'm and I'm like, I know Katie Hoff, but I really want to know Katie. Hoff. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so is, where, where do you start? How how do we, how do we how do we get into your story? So the, I would say you know the prologue is something I'm most proud of. It, it happens in Beijing. It happens at a very pivotal moment in my life that I think forever changed how I viewed my career. And it's a, a blink of an eye. And it's, you know, really draws you in. It kind of goes through and, and tells a, a race that happened, but one that I never really talk about. I've actually never even seen the race played back. This is the 400 free. So that's where it kind of starts. And then you dive all the way back into getting to know me as a human being, getting to know me as a little kid, my quirks, my obsessive qualities, how I started, um, and, and then kind of takes you on a journey uh, through part one. And part one is all the way through Beijing. And then uh, part two, which I'm especially proud of, goes through you know, the challenges, I call it kind of post-Beijing and then into life as a swammer and then talking about 
you know, all of those transitions and that uh, really difficult piece. So this is when I say I'm really, it, I didn't mean to do it this way, but I'm very happy that I ended up waiting five years post-career because it allowed me to touch on a subject that, you know, I think is very prolific right now, which is that mental health piece of what happens when the sport gets ripped away from you. <laughs> and you're- I, was, I was writing down the structure of your book because it's going to certainly inform the way this conversation goes. Everybody wants to, you know, it, it, we come to this dramatic moment where we compete on the Olympic stage, but so many, there are so many steps that get us there. And, uh, is there, is there, is there, some, is there a way to, I don't want you to give away everything in your book because I, I want people to buy it and we're going to tell them exactly how to buy it. But the, you know, is there, is there a moment in your development that really crystallizes who you are? Is there, you know, is there an anecdote that's, you know, that, that, that you share, you take us uh, you know, inside in terms of your development when you're on the road to Beijing? Yeah, I think there's a couple. I think, you know, for me, and I have this shirt, Relentless, so that's, I think, the in, in the back, clearly, and my TED Talk was about being relentless. I think, you know, Athens was definitely a pivotal moment, and obviously that's, I, I went to the Olympics when I was 15, and there were moments leading up to that, but I feel like that was a moment in my career where I could have gone one way or the other. I could have, you know, I Again, not giving away too much, but people in the swimming world know what happened to me in Athens. You know, I, I had kind of a rough start, threw up all over the pool deck, just not your ideal Olympic debut. And at that point, you know, I think I, I could have been like, forget this. Like, I'm, you know, walking away from this. But, you know, it's kind of where I truly was able to embrace, okay, you know, regardless of what this sport, what this life throws at me, I'm going to keep getting back up. And it's because I have this passion uh, for what swimming gives me. It gives me this feeling of extraordinary. It gives me this feeling of passion. And so I think that meet and that period of time in my life taught me a lot about who I was as a person and the grit that I had to just keep forging on. Um, and then obviously it, it worked really well in those four years leading up to Beijing. When I talk to folks who are non-swimmers and they're curious about the, the experience of being, uh, being on the road to the Olympics or having, having Olympics in your back pocket, they always ask about the, they ask about the teenage years. It's like, how does that, because everyone has this, this moment when they're a teenager and you know, it, def, it, it defines us. There's lots of pains. There's lots of successes. There's a lot of pains. <laughs> there's a but, lot of pain. Uh, but, but the Olympic experience puts a whole new wrinkle on it. And uh, is that something that you touch on in Blueprint? Definitely. Yeah, I, I think that's even the struggle, right? You know, I'm growing up, I'm trying to be a normal teenager, but at the same time, I'm trying to make an Olympic team. And I, I wasn't normal, right? You know, I, my, the way that I was, the way that I am, had a very much of an obsessive quality. So I, I, I dive deep into stories that are so embarrassing of just how, you know, crazy I was with the details, you know, turning around and coming back to practice because I forgot to do 10 pull-ups, like stuff like that, that I really share into my psyche as a teenager growing up and, and kind of my tug and struggle with being a teenager and wanting to go on a date and, and do all the things that a teenage girl is dealing with, the insecurities that a teenage girl is dealing with. Um, and so that's another piece I, I wanted to uncover is, is the human side of it. And I think sometimes you know, Olympians or professional athletes or, or anyone who's extraordinary at what they do get put on this pedestal. And it's like, no, <laughs> we're just human beings. And we go through all of these same insecurities, struggles, worries, doubts that, that everyone else does. It's just how we respond to those that really matters. This is where it gets super unique because on your run up to Beijing, it was uh, a very unique Olympics. And you are literally the epicenter of the Olympic universe um, <laughs> at your club um, in BAC under, under Bob Bum and, and training in the same pool with Phelps. So what's, uh, you know, you know, it, that experience, it's like, how do you, how do you, how do you manage that? He wasn't there, but he was like, you know, you were in the same oxygen. Associated. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's, you know, again, that's a very big piece that I dive into. And I was, you know, fortunate enough to really have Michael's support. You know, he wrote, he kind of endorsed it on the back and, and was wonderfully supportive with this whole process. But yeah, my narrative in 2008 was very much 
dependent or associated with Michael Phelps. And it wasn't that people expected me to go and win eight gold medals. That just wasn't realistic. But coining female Phelps has this association. So, um, you know, and obviously those are my expectations. Like anyone who's competing for Olympic Games is going for gold medals. But I think for me, it was inviting people into understanding what I was going through. I mean, I take it day by day in Beijing um, of exactly what was going on in my mind, how I was feeling um, and just how I was feeling afterwards of just, just devastation of feeling like I failed when I left, you know, I think a lot of people would be surprised like you left the Olympic games with three medals and you should be so proud. And I was feeling the actual opposite. So um, that was a really difficult, difficult piece, uh, to dive into. Uh, my husband could kind of knew where I was and then the book writing process based on my mood. Like he'd be like, are you in uh, this stage? Like, yeah, I am. Um, but again, like I'm so proud of being able to show that because that needs to be heard. People need to understand that people need to feel that because so many young athletes go through that all the time, right? Expectations are high in so many sports, so many endeavors and what do you do when you don't reach expectations and how do you get back up from that after putting pouring blood, sweat, tears into that? It's, yeah, it's a, it's been, a really hard thing to do. It's been 12 years and I'm, and I'm sitting here like everybody else. It's like, I feel like I know everybody's story in detail. The, um, and I was there, I was, I mean, I was, I was there, I was on deck and I was always around. Paul was your coach and Paul was a, a unique individual is this, is this someone that comes into the narrative? Because it seems like he was man helping you manage expectations and manage what was happening. Um, yeah. Yes. So Paul's definitely in there. Um, you know, I think our relationship definitely had um, its ups and downs, like, like any, like any coach in summer. So I definitely delve into that. I think, you know, he was also going through similar things with being, he was one of the youngest coaches in 2008 on that team. And so, you know, I, I actually tried to see both sides, right? Tried to understand now I'm you know, 31 years old. And I think that's how old he was when I was in Beijing, or I think he was like 32, which is wild to me looking back of, wow, you have this, you know, swimmer who just turned 19 years old and all these expectations are on, how do you handle that as a coach? Um, so I, I was able to look at that from a different lens and a different perspective when analyzing my story and, and getting that all out. So I appreciate the fact that you have your, you, you had to go to a place of real empathy and put your, you know, walk a mile in his shoes. And it sounds like you went through that process, uh, which makes me think this is a, a book that coaches need to buy. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that. Um, I, I don't, um, I think coaches are, I think we forget that as athletes, right? And coaches are human beings too. And they're going through stressors. And, and you, you know, when you're that age, you look at your coach like, oh, they're supposed to have all the answers and oh, they're perfect when that it's actually worse for them because they're standing on the pool deck and you get up on the blocks and they have zero control at that point, you know? And so, um, yeah, it's like, how do you, how do you interact with your athlete? How do you support your athlete? And how do you sometimes, you know, figure out what to do with your emotions when you need to be their support system too. So um, yeah, I, I would highly recommend it because I am very honest about that piece of things. And I think it would help a lot of coaches. In terms of, uh, I don't want to make this analogy, but I'm going to make this analogy. It might upset some people, but it's not the same. Oh, it's geez. <laughs> like when you, when you leave the Olympics and you come back home and you decompress it kind of, it feels like you, you've left war, you know, you've worked for so long and then you have this huge competition. And, uh, I'm, I think that in terms of our, our, the way our neural pathways and what, what you experience as a human being, it's probably, it's not the same, but it's a similar arc. Uh, do, do you feel like there was trauma? Do you feel like you were, you were dealing with some level of, of, did you, did you stuff your feelings down after this experience post Beijing? What happened? Yeah, well, it's funny. In the book, I actually compare uh, a scene to the Hunger Games. So you're not that far off in that analogy. Um, I think, yeah, and, and it's funny because in that moment, 
you know, I, 2009 for me was rock bottom. You know, I was crying every day. I was depressed. I, I get into that piece in the book. And I, I don't think I realized just how much that experience affected me mentally, emotionally until much later on. Like, I don't think I even recovered from it until I stepped away in 2012. And, you know, I, I tried to work with different therapists. I tried to talk to people, but it's really hard when you're in this swirling vortex to recognize that no matter who says it to you, you have to recognize it yourself. And I think that's something, again, that's why I wanted to so rawly talk about it because maybe that helps just one person realize, okay, I'm in a bad state and I need to, you know, get help. I need to figure out a way out of this hole from, and I need to face the trauma that I just went through. Like I just didn't, it was, you know, and that's what athletes do, right? We have pain, whether it's physical or mental, we shove it down because we need to be tough and we move on. And I say so many times in the book of like, well, that's just what I'm supposed to do. That's just what I'm supposed to do. Like I'm supposed to go, I'm supposed to work hard. I'm supposed to win medals. I'm supposed to do this, check the boxes, check, check, check. I say that all the time in the book and it's like, take a second. And I don't know if it's, I mean, if it's definitely a maturity thing, but I look back and I'm like, how could I have had the perspective to know that that was going on while it was going on? Uh, A lot of people, some people know this, not a lot of people know this. So um, I've been in therapy since I was in my twenties. My wife has runs a full clinical, she's a clinical therapist. She has a full practice. Um, so this is like our life and we're in marriage, you know, like we've been in marriage counseling since we've been married. So I'm deep into this stuff, but I'm deep into the process of, of like what you remember and the pain and God, I wish I had these tools when I was an athlete. So this is the question. So for, for me in 1988, I lost at the Olympics and the, the, the moment of, 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 of really having a terrible event and like the, the taste of the, in my mouth and the feeling of my fingers curled around the edge, not wanting to get out of the pool, just the utter S show. You know, it was just terrible. Yeah. Stuck in my brain, crystal clear because pain does that to you. Um, I actually went through and like, I did EMDR to clear that out. If if you're, you know, I actually went in and and worked on that to try to take that emotion away. But because that thumbnail had so much real estate in my brain, is there something you know that 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 crystallizes for you uh, your 08 experience that was tough? That was like you know this is pain. Was it, it was an image? Can do you have that picture? Do you have that moment? I definitely have probably two. I mean, I, I'll never forget the feeling of like touching the wall after the 400 and just just hoping upon all hopes that I heard my name and not the other athlete's name, Rebecca Adlington, and hearing that name. Um, so there's that one for sure. And then for me, there's just, there's always been a, a trigger and it's, I'm working on it, but if, if anyone, there are moments where I felt like there was, if anyone ever doubts my effort level or integrity and not as much integrity, but the effort level, because I felt like that happened in certain circumstances that to this day, but I'm aware of it now is a huge trigger. Like I will start bawling and I'll be like, wait, why am I bawling? It's because of those things. And I think the more and more we can realize those things and understand why these things are happening, but I wouldn't have been able to pinpoint that even two years ago, you know, because I've kind of had to face it all and deal with it. But again, like that's like you, to your point, you were able to pinpoint that, but that's because you've been doing therapy for years and you understand it. And that's hard in itself, right? To sit there and face yourself is one of the most difficult, vulnerable, scary things out there. But once you do it and you get on the other side of it and you embrace it, it's, it's still really hard, but at least you feel like, you know, any athlete, right? You want next steps, you want goals. So, okay, so how can I get myself to the other side and find peace and maybe happiness and, and, um, you know, like myself, right? And um, it's worth it. It's really worth it. And, and that's, and the beautiful part is that this is part three of your book, right? This is the transition post paging yeah. and part three is, is, is finding new passion, but it's, uh, before you get there, you've, you had some, you had some, you had some more trials and I, and I be honest with you, I forgot about this. I remember swim, swam reporting on it. 
but it's very dramatic. The, the pulmonary em- embolism, the, it's blood clot. Uh, yeah. That's frightening. I mean, I, how, how much of, of what, how did that impact you in terms of just fear of death? Is it, uh, was it, was it at that level or was it just like, wow, this is going to cost me my career? Yeah. And I'm embarrassed to say that it was definitely the second, right? And I think that's because again, like athletes think that, that, you know, there's, um, I remember my husband not literally punching me, but looking like shooting daggers at me in the hospital because they, you know, I finally caught it after weeks on end of, of not catching what was going on with me. And they told me I was going to have to be on blood thinners. And I immediately think thinning my blood. And I was like, okay, well, like, how much is that going to affect my endurance? And the doctor was like, what? And, you know, again, I, that's, it's embarrassing to say. Yeah, I was just like, okay, like, literally, you almost just died. So you can just stop talking now. But it's, it's that mentality of like, okay, well, like, when can I get back in the pool? And, and the more I, you know, I was fortunate enough to to work with Zarelto, which is the blood thinner I, I was on. And I was then going around and speaking to doctors conventions and raising awareness. And I found out just how deadly a pulmonary embolism can be, especially, you know, it already traveled to my lungs. I flew six hours, you know, from California to Miami with them in my lungs. Um, and it was just wild. And it's my biggest injury of my career. Like I never, I was fortunate enough. I never had anything big that took me out for more than a week and um yeah it was definitely devastating to have that happen at a point in a a moment where I felt like I was kind of on my way back to finding the passion in the sport and enjoying things and and owning my process and then it was like okay curveball (laughs) there was just just as a a, you know breaking down the on, on on the side of media but our staff you know, I just, I have to take a step back. I remember a few years before, I remember when you, you were talking about like, you know, if you doubted my, my commitment and, uh, and that was a trigger for you. But I remember there being a wall, like you, you had a toughness about you, you had a shell at a certain period of time. And then it seems like I didn't see you for a while. And then you came back. And the next time I was thinking about Katie Hoff, it was because the editorial staff was going Hoff's back and she's, she's, she's making a move. Like she's, She's really doing well. And there was this anticipation of, wow, this is, this is going to be a new chapter. And um, so I, don't, I, I, did, I wanted to honor the fact that this was actually, uh, you, you were on the ramp up. And there were a lot of expectations out there that, wow, we're, we're going to see a rebirth of a huge talent. And this was a huge disappointment. And, but, you know, to fans, but, you know, you lived through it. It's uh, how do you know? What happened when you knew it's like my career's over? What what's that moment like? Yeah, it's um again I I go really in depth into this, but it was actually another piece of it too. So I had this, and it was like okay, so finally found that seven weeks of misdiagnosis. Like I was going, I was at the point where I was going to like I'll never forget. I went to this physical therapist or something because they thought it was like an intercostal strain. And he had me like doing these like weird breaths, and he like hit me like with the like uh, like pole and like I remember texting my husband and he I was so excited I'm like this is gonna work and bless his heart he's so supportive he was like oh that's great but like no so finally when I you know I got the diagnosis it was like okay the blood thinners you know essentially help your body dissolve the clots and I kept forging on but I, I kept struggling and I kept having these moments in practice where I would just kind of just die because I didn't have that lung capacity. And then I ended up having another surgery because um, my thymus gland was double. So they thought it was associated with that. So they took that out. And I'll never forget standing, I was standing in the chip aisle at Publix, getting ready for my bachelorette party, like right before my wedding. Uh, and the, the surgeon called me and I was, I was so excited because I thought, okay, this is, I'm good now. You took the surgery out. I've got a full year until Rio. Let's do this. I'm about to get married. This is great. And he was just like, I just want to let you know that, you know, based on all your scans, like your, the scar tissue buildup is, is going to significantly decrease your lung capacity. And, you know, it, it's going to be fine for you walking around and stuff, but I, I don't know if, you know, Olympic Olympics is in the cards. And I just remember just breaking down in the aisle and I almost wanted to be like, okay. And he said it so cavalierly, like, I want to be like, all right, what if I was like, okay, well, you're going to be able to walk around, but you're not going to be able to be a surgeon anymore. Like that was <laughs> this anger of, okay, but this is my life. 
And I still pushed on after that. I still tried. Maybe I can just do sprints, which I'm not a sprinter. <laughs> um, and, it, and it finally came down to the point of I was at peace with it when I walked into Andy Kershaw's office at University of Miami and I told him I wanted to be done and I felt relief because I was in so much pain, not physically, but at that point mentally, like, I'm like, I made this comeback to enjoy this. And now every single day I'm struggling and, you know, dying and like, this isn't why I did this. And this isn't, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not myself again. So I need to get out of this for myself, for my husband, for my family, for my teammates. And I felt relief. But at that point it was still, I was still like, okay, I made this decision and it's good because I'm not in this pain, but now what? And that's, you know, kind of what I talk about now, now what? And why did I disappear from the swimming world for five years? It's tough. It's tough. Athletes want to be able to control the end of their career. And grudgingly, it looks like you did that. Uh, no one wants to be told by someone else when it's over. And yeah. uh, it's interesting that you were told that it was over and you still pushed on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just remember thinking like, okay, surgeon, like, what do you know? You know, I can still, you know, maybe I can't do the 400s or maybe I could do the 200s, you know? And, um, it was just, yeah, it, I, I should have kind of taken it from there, but I'm like, Tom Dolan had did it, you know, <laughs> maybe I can do it, but it just wasn't, um, it just wasn't ever the same. And luckily, I mean, I, I don't feel a twinge anymore, but I did for about two years. Like he said, it would take a few years for the scar tissue to kind of, come out and, and be just like any injury, right? A knee, a shoulder. Um, and now I, I can push it pretty hard, but yeah, it was, um, kind of, I could have never predicted. And, 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 and part three, it's, uh, this is a moment where you're pinning, you know, this is who I am. This is my adult life. And the, the funny thing about being an adult is that's most of your existence. We we're defined by this whole swimming thing and this Olympic thing, but it's not really who you are. You know, your life is, is your adult life and, and your mental health and, and your well-being. What, 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 are you, what, are you, what are you saying in, in part three? What is the, what's this narrative for you? Yeah, so the, the narrative, I, I, you know, I really dive into, I, I just remember, at first it was the denial thing, right? Like, I'm just going to push everything down. I'm not, I'm not able to really face anything that happened, like the pain in my career. So I'm just going to go on and I'm going to define myself as Katie Hoff, the business person or Katie Hoff, the salesperson, and I'm just be really great at that. And that worked for a little bit, uh, but I was still having these random meltdowns and everyone else around me knew why, but I just was, kind of, again, perpetuating the denial. So I, I kind of tried everything and got experience and said, you know, not wanting to own being an Olympian, then wanting to own being an Olympian. I had this roller coaster of a few years and I didn't get better until I was able to just write this book and, and own who I am and, and feel strong about that and, and realize that there's not just one thing to me, right? It's not just swimming. There can be swimming, but then there's also room for all these other things. And I think the biggest thing for me that I learned through all of it was swimming was just the vehicle that gave me the feeling that I need every day to be happy, which is feeling extraordinary. Like that's what swimming gave me. And and the second I was able to actually believe that and realize that was just a huge turning point in my life where it's like, okay, well, I don't have swimming anymore, but I can definitely find things that give me those feelings of fulfillment again. It's hard, but being able to even share my story does that. And so that was, I still have those hard days. And, and sometimes, you know, even watching ISL, I'm like, God, that looks so fun and cool. I wish I was out there racing, but it, it's, I'm on the path of that, you know, better kind of trajectory of, of being able to understand when I have those tough days, why? Because if you don't know why, then you have nowhere to go. If you do know why, it's okay, well, here's how I can deal with it and find my extraordinary again or do something to, to make me feel fulfilled or passionate. So, yeah. You know, every athlete has this journey. They're, they go through yeah. the trials and tribulations. They, they, they move on to the big moment where it could just be, you know, uh, so, you know, competing in college, D1, D2, D3, and then they go through that period of time where they retire. 
And uh, it's not always, you know, everyone's not going to break a world record or, or, or go to the Olympics and win medals, but they do follow that same path. So if you're out there and you're a kid and you want to see the, the chapters you're going to live through and give a little glimpse into it, uh, Blueprint's a book for you. And it's, um, and I always appreciate seeing these stories told over and over because I always think I know what they are. And they're always, the, you know, your fingerprint on this, on our sport is very, very unique. And uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. it, it, it so are, are you, so this is going to be coming out uh, Black Friday. Is that correct? Yeah, November 27th. And it, I, I think this is the perfect gift. You know, you could buy it then or you could buy it and hold it as a stocking stuffer, right? Yeah, for Christmas, yeah. the, excuse me, the year and holidays. Uh, I think yeah. you can. I think you can fit this in a stocking. It, so if I, the stockings we have are pretty big, so I think you could. I think you could. If um, if, if I if, if I want to buy the book, do you, you know? Uh, is it where, where can I go buy the book? So it'll be it'll be dropping November twenty seventh on Amazon. So I'll provide you with the link as well, so it's just easily accessible. But yeah, it'll be it'll be on Amazon. I'm trying to get to be Amazon number one on day one, so hopefully I can get competitive with those steps too. <laughs> okay, so you got to get all your buddies, all your all your all your buddies to, to to start tweeting it out and pushing it out, and we can do that. The uh, that's it's really cool. Congratulations. Do you have any any parting thoughts about this whole process, and you know what you know what's in store for the future? I think parting thoughts, one, I just feel very grateful that I was even able to have the opportunity to do that. You know, it was such a surreal moment to be sitting in this seat, this recording seat and reading my book for the audio version, which will also be out on November 27th and looking down and going, this is, I'm reading my story right now. This is crazy and very surreal. Um, so yeah, I think just very grateful. Um, another piece that I did want to say in the book, that there's actually going to be QR codes, which we all know very well because we have menus and all of these things during the pandemic, but it's actually going to have moments where, you know, I say, I break my first world record and you can click and see it. And I'm going to have, you know, TEDx talk, you can see it. Little me when I'm swimming, you can see it. So it has that interactive piece where, you know, and there's actually videos like interviews that I hadn't even seen, you know during Beijing or after um, trials, um, which was really fun, but that'll hopefully get, draw people in and allow people to get that extra, you read it and then you can actually see it on your phone. Sounds um, like a book, multimedia and a documentary all in one. Yeah, it, it, um, I have, it wasn't my idea, I have, to, I have to say, but I was so fortunate to be able to put those in there and um, have that interactive so people can really get to know me that much more. I'm going to have kind of the opening where it'll just be me here talking to you and then kind of a parting thoughts as well of just thanking people for wanting to, wanting to read my story, for caring, for, for um, just, just taking a time to understand me, um, not just the swimmer, but me as the person. And for that, having the opportunity to share that out, that gives me that extraordinary feeling for sure. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.